everyone, and welcome to our series on being a citizen. I'm Frank Martin, director of the IP Standard Museum at South Carolina State University. And today we will be talking with uh, artist Dr. Kizzy Staley Gibson and author Dr. Walter Curry as part of our own Being a Citizen uh, series. And this discussion is on the arts, education, and entrepreneurship. Uh, the program is being presented by the IP Standback Museum and Planetarium at South Carolina State University, co-sponsored in part by the Department of Social Sciences at South Carolina State, the South Carolina Progressive Network also. And uh, today is April 13th, 2022. And as I said before, I'm Frank Martin. So our series um, is part of the uh, newly inaugurated, uh, which we hope will be annual Twigs Rose Festival of the Arts in Orangeburg County. Um, and this is a celebration of our local HBCUs and of higher education in Orangeburg County, including uh, Orangeburg Technical College. And it's, in, it's supported in part by the Orangeburg County Council. And the IP Standard Museum on the uh, campus of South Carolina State University is a unique facility that combines a uh, museum for the arts, which is about the expression of our inner lives, and a planetarium. And the planetarium, of course, is about the composition of the universe, about space, about what makes up the essential uh, chemical elements of everything that we see around us. So we are both interested in science and in humanities. And our facility is unique among HBCUs in the United States. We have a large gallery space of about 3,500 square feet shown here. Um, and we are able to show works by artists from many different parts of the world, from many different cultures. However, because we have a history as an historically black institution, we collect uh, African and African-American art and artifacts for our permanent holdings. And here you see two twin figures from the Yoruba culture of the Ede Ibeji, who are actually uh, representations of the spirits of um, lost children, um, who the uh, parents will venerate at the table and treat as if the person continues to be there in recognition of the loss of that spiritual presence. And we think it's important to teach our students about cultural diversity and about ancestral ideas on the intellectual ideas that have been passed into our, our contemporary culture from African diasporic sources, as well as the Eurocentric sources that are easily, more easily available. We also have an extensive collection of photographs in, uh, at the museum. And this is from Harlem on My Mind, which was a major in, uh, exhibition held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1969. Uh, and this exhibition was a watershed moment for the uh, study of museum exhibitions and museology because it transformed how exhibitions were presented. The conceptualist, Alan Scherner, um, intended to uh, create a, a sort of insight into these new media. And the exhibition consisted entirely of photographs of film and of soundscapes instead of the traditional uh, manual arts, uh, we are going to be talking to Dr. Staley Gibson, for example, who's a wonderful painter, but the exhibition that was installed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art did not include the painters and the sculptors and the printmakers from Harlem. And that created kind of quite a controversy. And so uh, discussing cultural interpretation is one of the special areas of interest in our museum collection. As part of the exhibition, we have beautiful images like this one of Langston Hughes, who is, of course, a very important literary figure for American culture and American poetry and, and uh, writing. And this is when he was a student, a young man at Lincoln University, also an HBCU, in Pennsylvania, uh, where he studied before he became a part, a major part of the Harlem Renaissance. And I'd like to offer our disclaimer. Um, our program today uh, is going to express ideas that are not the opinions of the administrators or officials of South Carolina State University or any of the associated institutions, but are really the carefully considered opinions and ideas of our individual expert guests who are distinguished in their respective fields of endeavor. And our panelists are speaking here as private citizens and not necessarily as institutional representatives, although we do have a candidate for political office. So she'll be representing her um, platform. And so our special guests today are Dr. Kizzy Staley Gibson. Dr. Gibson is a native of Orangeburg 
She is a graduate of Orangeburg Wilkinson High School in Orangeburg. She has a BA degree from Claflin University where her, I think both her parents uh, were teachers for a period of time, um, where she was in the Alice Tisdall Honors College. So that means she was an excellent student. And she has the MA from Columbia College here in Columbia, South Carolina, um, with a specialty in divergent learning. So she's very aware of issues in education. She also has the education doctorate in, uh, from North Central University, particularly in online learning for K through 12 grades and adults. And I, I'm going to have to ask you some questions at some point, Dr. Staley, about um, the uh, things we've discovered because of COVID in terms of online education and access and how important that is for young people and get more of your opinions about online education in general, since you are specifically trained in that area and are an advocate. And Absolutely. thank you. And then we have Dr. Walter Curry, who is also a native of Orangeburg. And it's Dr. Curry who connected me again with uh, Dr. Staley, whom I've known Dr. Staley since she was a young student in middle school because you, your, your parents would teach the annual arts consortium. And we always use the fine arts building at South Carolina State. And so I was used to seeing you run around as a very young girl. And I found out you now have teenagers yeah. of your own. <laughs> it's a shock. <laughs> I can hardly believe it. But um, Dr. Curry, also has a doctorate in education. He's a graduate of South Carolina State University. And I'll ask him more about his distinguished uh, reward award of the 40 under 40 that uh, he received. Was it just last year, Dr. Curry? Yes, la last, last year. year. Last year, yeah. And Dr. Curry is not only an educator specializing in curriculum and instruction with his degree from Argus University in Sarasota, Florida, but he's also an entrepreneur. And he has launched his publishing company, Renaissance Publications, and has two award-winning publications. One, The Thompson Family, Untold Stories from the Past, 1830 to 1960, and Awakening, which I have. My copy is right by my side here. Um, the C. Wright Ellison Family Saga. And I think this is uh, the cover of Awakening. And Dr. Curry can let us know later on in the program how if someone is interested in gaining access to his publication, how we uh, may uh, obtain a copy. And with that, I'm going to contextualize our discussion by looking at some of the examples of public art that uh, exists in South Carolina. And um, this, uh, of course, you both probably recognize as the African American History Memorial on the State House grounds in Columbia which is by Ed Dwight, with whom we had one of these conversations that are on being a citizen series. So the sculptor who started out as an aeronautical engineer became an artist. So that was very interesting and exciting to learn. And, and Ed Dwight was actually the first African-American to be invited by NASA to become an astronaut. So yeah, this memorial in South Carolina connects these extraordinary areas of science and arts uh, into one sort of work because of who made it. And it goes through the history that uh, Dr. Curry explores in his texts about his family, showing this uh, bronze cast impression of the very famous uh, engraving that uh, was about the ways in which Africans were packed into the prows of ships during the transatlantic slave trade. And there's also this altar-like area, which has stones that have been brought from the major regions of Africa where the uh, indigenous peoples were captured and kidnapped and brought to South Carolina. So the gene pool that make us up, because I also am uh, an indigenous South Carolinian, of those peoples from the Western coast of Africa are represented by these stones included in that memorial, in that history memorial. And on it, you have uh, bronze cast in relief, uh, images from the period of slavery, through the Civil War, through Reconstruction, with the inclusion of figures like Harriet Tubman, who made so many extraordinary contributions to liberating uh, enslaved Africans right here in South Carolina. And you have uh, individuals like Robert Brown Elliott, who served in the Reconstruction uh, legislature and helped reconfigure the state uh, um, constitution in South Carolina. 
And then there's the period of the Great Migration. Many South Carolinians left. Uh, and I think um, Dr. Steely Gibson's your father went to Washington for a while and worked. And he live. was uh, in Pennsylvania and in Washington, D.C. That's right. So it was commonplace for uh, many of the uh, African Americans to leave the state and then return. Uh, some people return. And of course, you go through that period of civil rights and on into the achievements of people like Dizzy Gillespie, Althea Gibson, um, Ernest Finney, who became the first chief justice, but the earliest justice in our state Supreme Court was uh, an attorney who actually taught at Claflin, this Jonathan Jasper Wright, Ron McNair, the astronaut, so many distinguished uh, individuals. But on our history memorial, the history of memorial has no names of any of the individuals, which I thought was quite a shock, quite a surprise. Um, and that was a peculiar stipulation, I think, when uh, it was going through the legislature. And then we have the recent memorial that was created on the campus commemorating the students who, whose lives were sacrificed during the Orangeburg Massacre. Um, Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond, and Delano Middleton, named for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And these sculptures are taken from images by uh, Orangeburg photographer Cecil Williams, who also has a national reputation as someone disseminating or using the arts to help transform society in very positive ways to make us aware of Orangeburg's role in civil rights. And Cecil's photographs were used by Dr. Tolaluke Filani to create these beautiful bronze cast images. These are photographs from my colleague Maggie O'Hara. Um, but he took that two-dimensional image and fleshed it out into three dimensions for Henry Smith. Just incredibly sensitive modeling. And this is showing us some of the power of art. Samuel Hammond, the photograph by Cecil, and Dr. Filani's uh, photograph, I mean, Dr. Filani's sculpture in bronze, photographed by Maggie O'Hara. And of course, the one that I think is perhaps most striking, young Delano Middleton, who was a high school student, he wasn't a college student, who was caught in the crossfire uh, on our campus. And this portrait that Dr. Filani makes is so sensitive. It's, it's so lifelike to see in bronze this a translation of the features um, that he only knew from these two-dimensional objects shows us the power of art as a communications tool and um, also the psychological value that art can have. So with that as a context in our minds, mm -hmm. and also the thing that Dr. Falani is doing is he's uniting our campus as an HBCU to the traditional, beautiful, naturalistic sculpture uh, that was cast in his home country, his original country of Nigeria, in the culture of Ile Ife. So this is a thousand year old bronze casting tradition that is translated onto our campus um, to enrich the cultural heritage of our students. I can't say how exciting this is as a development and also a, this beautiful terracotta a traditional Nigerian work. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'd like to um, pose my first question to Dr. Staley Gibson and say, Dr. Staley Gibson, what was it that inspired you as an artist, and I might add a, a very talented young woman, uh, young artist, what was it that inspired you to become involved in education? Well, uh, you already stated that I grew up in a household of educators and it really extends even beyond my mom and dad's um, pursuit of education. My grandmother was actually a teacher assistant and she instilled in her children that actually she told all six of her daughters, you are going to Claflin and you are going to major in education. And so um, being a teacher was modeled so beautifully for me throughout my entire life. And um, I was able to just see firsthand how they were able to impact students um, at Orange for Wilkinson and at Claflin University, South Carolina State University. And I knew that was the path for me, I felt it was the perfect fit with my personality. Um, I love serving, I love helping, I love uh, creating. So I knew teaching was going to be the profession that I would choose very early on. 
Outstanding. Um, and I guess I should throw a question at Dr. Curry so he could jump into the conversation too. So Dr. Curry, the same question, what made you decide to become an educator and a writer? Was there a, a moment, a, a specific moment in time that you knew that you needed to uh, be someone who helped people to learn? Hey, thank you, uh, Dr. Martin. Uh, great question. Um, like uh, Dr. Uh, Gibson, um, her family, uh, my family on my father's side, my grandmother, uh, Lizzie Williams Curry, uh, pushed education. Uh, many of my aunts uh, graduated from Claflin University. Um, two of them graduated from South Carolina State University. And so I remember going to my grandmother's house and I saw a large copy of my aunt's degree. Um, and it said doctor of philosophy. Um, her name is Dr. Maddie Curry Cheek, um, who received her doctorate in special education. And so when I went to school, um, I used to tease my uh, classmates that I have doctors in my family. Uh, they would say, uh, you mean uh, professional uh, medical doctors? I said, no, professional career um, doctors. And so education has always been in my blood. Um, I come from a great uh, generation of, of educators in my family, and the writing comes on my mother's side of her sharing family stories with me and doing research to confirm those family stories, which are in my books. Well, and I'm going to come back to you with that question about um, what prompted you to look into the history. Um, but first, I was going to go back to Dr. Staley and ask her, um, because Dr. Staley, I guess we should start out a little bit with your interest in the um, position of the superintendent of education in the state of South Carolina. Could you tell us a little bit about a why you were interested in that particular position? What um, uh, prompted you to want to try to take some action to make to take some corrective action about the problems or the challenges in South Carolina education? And we'll come back to Dr. Kerr and find out more about his family saga, his family legacy. Absolutely. I have been teaching since 2003. And even prior to being um, a full-time teacher, I watched my parents actively, you know, serve as educators in the community. And just from my own observation, I saw this very slow decline. And I never really saw the quarter of shame being addressed in a way that someone who came from the quarter of shame would address those issues. And I know we, we tend to say, let's throw money at it. Money will fix this issue. And time has shown that it's not necessarily money. I mean, when you look at my platform, it really focuses heavily on a certified mentorship program. As uh, Dr. Curry mentioned, you know, we both saw education modeled for us. We both saw character virtues modeled for us. We saw that servant leadership modeled for us. And I feel that that made a huge difference in the decisions that we made um, coming from um, that quarter of shame, that I-95, Orangeburg sits, sits in that region. And so we were able to make decisions and take hold of opportunities that catapulted us into where we are today, you know, sitting with doctorate degrees in the field of education as authors and artists, because it was modeled for us, even despite the fact that we came from very, very humble beginnings. Um, we both did. And I think that that speaks to how strongly it, it, it matters for the community, those who have experienced success and those who may not have experienced success from the beginning, but have come back and, and done great things, how important it is for them to pour into the lives of students who may come from a single parent home, who may have a parent who works 12 hours a day and they want to be involved, but because of industry, not being in their area, they're unable to. So that, that certified mentorship program really serves to help encourage the student, guide them, direct them by people in the community who have done great things. I think that's so important. But serving as superintendent of education is, is multifaceted. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of issues throughout the state that we definitely need to tackle. But I do feel that parental involvement is extremely important because that is the number one determining factor 
in a child's success. It supersedes uh, your background, your culture, you know, how much money you have. It supersedes all of that um, because the voice that a child hears is so important. And that first voice is the voice of their parent. So getting, getting parents back involved is going to be key. Um, of course, making curriculum changes so that what we're teaching students is factual um, as far as history, exposing the good, the bad, the ugly, the things that we don't want to repeat. Mm -hmm. um, we have to make sure that, that all of it's there and that it's, it's served through a lens of, of forgiveness and redemption and so forth. I'm going to thank you for bringing up the perfect segue to go to Dr. To Curry because Dr. Curry is a curriculum specialist and I need to ask him a little bit about you know, what a curriculum specialist does and how a curriculum specialist performs and interacts with uh, the public schools. But before I do that, I'm going to explain or maybe I should let you explain uh, Dr. Uh, Staley Gibson what the Carter of Shame actually is because some of our viewers may see this and not know what that's referring to. And you mentioned the I-95 Carter. So would you just fill in a little bit about what the card of shame is, why it's called the card of shame, and um, how it shows that the problems in different parts of our state, maybe the challenges that are facing in one part of the state may be very different from challenges in another part of the state. Well, that quarter that I speak of, it has about 17 counties, uh, Bamberg County, Beaufort, Calhoun, Clarendon, um, Colton, Darlington, Dillon, Dorchester, Florence, um, Hampton County, Jasper County, Lee, um, Marion, Marlboro, Orangeburg, Sumter, Williamsburg. And if you notice that the, the running theme with these are, is not a lot of industry there. They're very um, economic, economically challenged areas. Um, they are often, the facilities, the school facilities are often in need of repair. Um, and I think the number one thing that stands out about this area is that the children who live in this area do not have access to the exposure that a child living in a Charleston area or the upstate Greenville Farmer area may have. And I feel that that is something that is limiting these students. They need exposure to culturally relevant things. They need exposure to, um, the, I mean, the list goes on and on. It's, it's a long list, but I think in Orangeburg, we were very fortunate because we are college town and we saw a huge influx of people from all types of backgrounds um, especially with the international student programs that we had at Claflin University and at uh, South Carolina State University it brought in opportunities to have dialogue with people who we may not have would have had the opportunity to even meet if we weren't situated within a college town. So getting the exposure to those children is going to be vital because when you think about standardized tests, they're not necessarily just focusing on um, what's one plus one. It's about exposure, questions about history and, and children, if you don't have that exposure, it's not likely that you're going to perform well when we consider the content that's um, on a standardized test. So um, definitely we've got to tackle the issues there and make sure that those students are provided the opportunities to soar and have exposure just like every other part of, of the state. And I think we're gonna see a balancing of the scales once we tackle um, the issues in that area. Because right now we have, I think the school that's, um, was number one was in Charleston County. Mm -hmm. And you say, how can you have a school that was number one in Charleston County, but our school system be considered failing in South Carolina? It's just because we need to balance the skills. We really do um, need to address that issue on I-95 with our students. Well, we'll point out that Charleston County is extremely wealthy. It's highly yes. populated. And so the tax base is one of the things that feeds yes. into what's available in the schools. And you're pointing out a lot of the issues. We're going to get more into that, but let's go back to Dr. Curry and say because you mentioned how important exposure is, and Dr. Curry is a curriculum specialist. Tell us about um, how what you teach helps establish what might be might be the curriculum, what might be what is being learned in the schools, uh, in the public schools, and, and and generally you're teaching teachers, yes. Oh, oh absolutely. Um, as a curriculum specialist, from my experience. Um, I have discovered that a curriculum specialist is someone who exposes um, the dynamics of the curriculum um, to the teachers. Uh, when I mean by that, um, I mean ideas, 
uh, resources, um, and, and be creative in how to um, teach the curriculum. Um, what I found in social studies with my partnership uh, with the Aiken Center for the Arts, uh, that many teachers um, feel that my books uh, fill gaps um, in the standards. And um, they appreciate it because my books focus on uh, eighth grade social study standards and um, US history constitutional standards. And so as a curriculum specialist, you have to be creative. Um, you have to think outside of the box and you have to uh, focus on the needs of the, the students um, as well as uh, the teachers. Um, and making sure that they're equipped to uh, teach uh, the students. Uh, what I've found also in my experience too is that uh, rarely um, students are, are asked about how they uh, feel about the curriculum, um, mm -hmm. how they feel about uh, what they are experiencing in, in what they're being taught. And so I think it's important um, as a curriculum specialist is to get student feedback, student reflection, and, and really know the students. I'm talking about learning styles. I'm talking about multiple intelligences because students bring gifts and talents um, to the classroom and the curriculum should reflect that. So um, the importance of integrating the student holistically with the curriculum is what you're talking about. And I'm thinking right now that some teachers might have a little bit of a challenge with saying, well, um, we need to involve our students in, you're not saying the structure of how the information is being presented, you're saying more about how the student responds to the ways in which the information is being presented to them. Is that what I'm- Absolutely. And, and what Dr. Gibson uh, mentioned about uh, cultural relevant um, teaching, cultural relevant pedagogy. Um, is not just primarily for African American students, but uh, what we are finding out that culture relevant pedagogy is for all students. So connecting culture um, to the curriculum. And so how do we do that? I'll give you an example. Um, Dr. Uh, Kajufu, um, he wrote a book uh, focusing on um, the plight of African American students. And he gave um, specific examples how to use culture relevant pedagogy. Uh, one example I'll share with you is uh, math. Um, from his uh, observation, he found that many African American students are fascinated with sports and hip hop. And mm -hmm. so, if you want to teach math, use um, hip hop um, and the um, professional sports. Or um, statistics. <laughs> to create a context. Yeah. Um, so that's culture. I mean, even when you look at um, art, um, art also uh, plays a role in the curriculum as well. Um, in social studies, um, we, um, as social studies teachers, um, historians, we always use art um, as a pretext, as a context. Uh, to teach uh, historical context and very um, historical connections. And you can do the same in other subjects as well, even in math, um, create an artistic um, context to um, focus on a specific uh, problem that the students want to solve. So that is what um, the curriculum should be. Um, like Dr. Gibson said, um, standardized testing um, is a major concern. Um, but at the same time, when you look at the classroom, uh, you want students to know the material to, to pass the standardized test, but you also want to give students an opportunity to show what they do. And so you talk about performance-based uh, um, assessments and constructive response um, assessments that could do that. That well, so you, you again, you're you're working perfectly off of each other because you sent me right back to Dr. Steele Gibson, who, um, as a candidate for the superintendent of South Carolina, uh, the the supervision of public education in South Carolina. Um, what do you see then, Dr. Staley, as the most important salient issue uh, in terms of what? 
would need to be addressed in education almost immediately. What, what is it that um, is just being very badly neglected now that needs to be corrected? I think I mentioned it earlier that we've identified parental involvement is number one. There is no substitute for parental involvement. I think coming off the heels of, of COVID-19, parents are ready to become engaged. However, we must uh, remove that wedge and, and, and bridge the gap between school districts and, and parents and the community because it takes the parent it takes the teacher, it takes administrators, it takes everyone in the community for um, to be involved to see students succeed. So number one, starting with the source, because all roads lead home. There's, there's no way around it. All roads lead home when we speak in reference to behavior, achievement, it all leads back home. So we have to go back and strengthen and provide resources um, and, and bridges for parents to engage and feel that if, you know, feel that their voice is being heard and that their needs are, the needs of their child are being met. Uh, we know that one size does not fit all, especially when we talk about education. We have to provide uh, the opportunities for, for every child, for their unique gifts, their unique talents. Um, but the first thing we have to tackle is, is making sure that we stress to parents that teachers, educators, we're not parents. It's not our job to parent your child. It's our job to teach them the content and make sure they understand it and can apply it to their everyday lives. Um, so there is going to be a huge focus on getting parents back involved, especially in, like I mentioned, that I-95 quarter. If you cannot be as involved as you want, would like to be, allow us to implement that certified mentorship program as a safeguard so your child does have um, someone that you can trust, number one, who is going to speak positively into them and help guide them and bring out their God-given talents and um, their unique gifts so that they can be successful. Um, so that's, that's number one, is getting that implemented and uh, getting parents' parental involvement. So I'm understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you're saying the certified mentors would be people who are trained to work with young people who would not necessarily be a family member, they could be, but they would not necessarily be a family member. And if the parent, is, let's say it's a single parent household and it's a mother or it could be a father mm -hmm. and that person's working 12 hours, they can't come to uh, teacher meetings. They, they are unable to come and do some of the advocacy for their child because we live in a state where wages for the most part are, are rather low. And um, as you were saying, there's not, uh, a lot of industry or, or, or economic opportunity or manufacturing mm -hmm. in many parts of the state. And, and what has often been referred to as the black belt of our state, let's just be honest, it, it's racialized to some extent. So you're, you're trying to have mentors trained. Now, how would you be able in that program to find sufficiently qualified people to, and I'm thinking, I, I'm not gonna mention any particular school districts. I know there's some teachers on here who could probably do a better job of doing that than I could. But I know that there are districts where there are such, there are very severe challenges. Mm -hmm. So even finding the mentors would be a difficulty. How would you be trying to bus people across the state in different areas? I mean, how, how would you address Not necessarily. That? We, I have, I've pulled out uh, members of society who I feel would, would be open to it. Of course, they're moms, dads who would not mind, you know, mentoring a child out that's not their own. Um, I have entrepreneurs, people like Walter, who's an author. Um, I have uh, officers, um, pastors who, you know, they're, they're mainly what they're doing during the week is not necessarily, you know, a nine to five who mm -hmm. would take on that challenge. Um, veterans who are, you know, retired um, would also serve uh, as mentors. But in, in my mind, I am seeing a, a possibly a, you know, week-long certification process where mm -hmm. we, kind of like what teachers go through with, you know, having to get the fingerprints done so that we, we ensure that you are safe to be around our students, background mm -hmm. checks, all of that, um, and then pair them with with children who would benefit from having them in their lives. And, and it's framed around K through uh, eighth grade 
And then of course, if needed in ninth through 12th grade, then yes, implement it there as well um, as cheerleaders for those mm -hmm. students. So I'm assuming that they're going to be meeting the students in the school environment. They, this would be an after school program or something also that may go on during the school day. So you might be using some retired persons, you might be using retired teachers to help implement a program like this. Absolutely. And it would be um, not not anything actually too difficult. You know, maybe go and have lunch with this child uh, once a week or twice a week. Go to one of their games if they're involved in sports or mm -hmm. go to the, the spelling bee challenge if they're doing that or whatever they're involved in. Just being present in their life, their lives is, is so important. And um, just making an effort to form that relationship with them. So I'm thinking again back to Dr. Curry because Dr. Curry is an author. And uh, I know that in our state, literacy is an enormous challenge. I don't know if Dr. Curry wants to talk to this issue or if you both want to say something about it, but um, how could you devise some programs to address the deficiencies in literacy? And the other thing is you mentioned the standardized test. One of the things that is found to be such a problem is that students have difficulty um, with conceptual understanding of complex issues. Uh, a lot of times, and I, I know this because of um, some challenges I've had with teaching young people who are preparing for just the, for the praxis in education, where you'd have to apply, for example, how other artists would influence your own work. So you'd have to think about your work and think about the work of someone else and see the connections between the two things and then articulate in a series of essays how your work is being influenced by someone else. And some people have, it's, it can be a challenge. So, and that's, that's about literacy, about reading and being able to understand and comprehend and going on to be able to connect ideas and, and go forward. So both of you, would you speak to, you know, what kinds of strategies you are seeing for how some of these issues, especially in that I-95 corridor where students don't have books in their homes, Students don't have parents with time to read to them. How can those uh, difficulties be addressed? And Dr. Saley, you've already said, we don't want to just throw money at it, but some of it, we're, we're, you, you need money, you need resources mm -hmm. to be allocated. So both of you just speak to that a little bit, please. Well, that mentorship program would fill some of those gaps because a part of their role as a mentor, I know when I served as a mentor, part of it was reading to that child during their lunch um, session, going over sight words after school with them. Um, so that would, that, that certified mentorship program would fill in some of those literacy gaps. And then again, making sure that we include the arts. We all know that the arts, when you're operating in that realm uh, as an artist, you're operating on the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy, which is creating. And when you condition your brain to, to operate in that manner, it, it kind of bleeds over into everything that you do. You begin to, to, to analyze not just writing, but the world around you. And it really helps with um, some of those skills that you were speaking of, being able to dissect and, and, and critique. And those are skills that artists tend to, to really flourish in. We tend to, to be able to you know, go back and forth. It's very fluid for us, it's easy because we, we've done it for so long in that realm of art. So providing those opportunities for students to create is vital. Um, so which kind of goes back to not cutting funding for the arts. We have to make sure that we are are putting funds in those areas because it's so important for student development. Oh, Dr. Curry, did you have any thoughts? Yes, um, I, I wanna echo um, everything that um, Dr. Gibson um, just said. Um, and I would like to add that um, the community has to uh, connect. Okay, the community has to connect with education. It has to be uh, a partnership between the community. Uh, I would like to add um, too that um, in my book, um, in the appendix section is um, a the story of um, Ulysses Kitchens, and Ulysses Kitchens was my ancestor cousin, and uh, he was the principal of Sardis School, and uh, one thing that. Um, Sardis School did, which was located in Sally, um, under his tenure, they um, created a community garden. Um, the community garden 
um, was um, cultivated by the students, um, the teachers, and the community. And so what happened at that time was the community became involved um, in education. And so it's going to take um, exposure. Um, students have to be exposed to uh, critical thinking. Um, students will have to be exposed in the context of how to think like a historian, um, think like an artist. Like you mentioned, Dr. Martin, about uh, the difficulty of students uh, trying to analyze complex information in disciplines because they're not being taught to think in that discipline. And so we're going to have to reevaluate um, how disciplines um, connect with work. Um, students um, have to really think in that specific discipline. Um, if your job is to um, analyze artwork, um, then um, you have to think like an artist. So they have to have the tools and the resources um, to do that. Well, see, so you brought up interdisciplinary studies and just one area that I'm, I happen to be very particularly interested in that because since I'm in the museum and planetarium and we have art and science, um, what I've always wanted to do is have a kind of workshop for young people to show how art is related to science, how the, the physics of artworks can tell us things about culture and history. Um, there was a professor at South Carolina State, unfortunately, he's no longer working there. It's Dr. Sun Jai Sin, who had come from China and he was a nuclear engineer and he would work with us in the museum to analyze the molecular level, the, um, uh, the degradation of radiation and isotopes in objects in our collection. And he would work with students who would help him, you know, take samples, and they would uh, take this to a radiology uh, uh, conserve uh, laboratory in North Carolina. They would bombard the isotopes with electrons, and they could see the rate at which the um, radioactivity was decreasing in those isotopes. Would tell how old the objects were, what kinds of chemical composition there was, and this is using science to give us more information about about art, about culture, about history. So I could take a, a sculpture from Nigeria and find out what part of Nigeria it was made in. So this is, as you can hear, this is crossing over all these, mm -hmm. these different lines. And a lot of people don't think of the arts as an entree. And I'm not saying that the arts have to be subordinate to the sciences at all. I'm, I'm, I'm the person who will not say, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, what's the that acronym that's always used. Um, I, I, all I can think of is right now is spell. <laughs> that's not it. STEM, STEM, STEM. STEM, STEM and STEAM. Yeah, yes. STEM and yeah. STEAM. <laughs> and um, the, the acronym I like is STREAM, which is science, technology, reasoning, aesthetics, mathematics, and engineering. Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's, it's more holistic thinking about it because STEM, you know, science, technology, it's very narrow. And most people don't recognize that the word art from the Greek term techne, techne is the word that meant art, which actually meant skill. It was translated into Latin as ars, which means skill. So an artist is a person who has a special skill, a developed skill, and all technology, and this is why I was bringing this next question to Dr. Staley Gibson, all technology is an art extension of a tool. And since you are the person who uh, has that specialist in uh, online education for K through 12 and adult. Um, what is the, in your mind, as a person running for the superintendent's office, what is the proper introduction of technologies to our student populations? Because the students have phones. Sometimes technology is a terrible distraction, mm -hmm. um, but it could be something used in the service of improving the quality of life but that's not generally happening. So give me some of your insights as a person who's specialized in introducing technology to both young and young people and adults. What vision would you have as a state superintendent for technology um, being implemented across our state? What innovations need to happen? 
Well, first we need to ensure that all students will have access. That's that's number one. It's you know, Wi-Fi. It us, yeah. yeah, it will do us absolutely no good to to give you know have a technology program that children can't access. So right. number one, making sure that they have um, access. When I worked, I, I did seven and a half years with a uh, virtual public school. Uh, mm -hmm virtual public charter school. And I will say that those seven and a half years really opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, e-learning is not for everyone. It's not for every child. Um, you have some students who will thrive and they're very independent in their learning. Um, and you have others who are heavily dependent on someone um, disseminating it to them. Right. And those type of children, I would say, you know, if you're not going to be self-guided, then online learning is really not the best uh, modality for you. Mm -hmm. um, so making sure that we are not pushing that on to students is very important to me. And that's from my own personal uh, experience with my, my children. My oldest son, he could do it, but it took mom saying, this is what you need to do today, right now. You have an hour to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, my daughter, on the other hand, she was very self-directed and she she thrived. And so from that experience as well, you know, and I think a lot of parents went through that during COVID, they realized that, hey, this is just not right for my mm -hmm. kid. Um, and I think parents also recognizing that, you know, you have to guide your, guide your child to uh, making the best decision for them as far as the modality of learning for them. Do I need to be in the classroom? Is virtual working for me? Um, and when virtual is done right, when it's done correctly, students will learn, they will be able to comprehend, you will be able to assess them properly when it's done correctly. And that's that's the huge caveat that mm. um, I think we, we miss the mark in South Carolina mm -hmm. when we implemented the virtual learning. And I know it was out of necessity. We had to do it quickly. Right. right. Um, uh, but if if we, you know, moving forward, we just need to make sure that teachers are prepared properly, that students are prepared and parents are prepared because with virtual learning, there is a, a heavy dependence on parental involvement. Parents mm -hmm. have to be involved in that process. Yeah. They have to be attentive to what their child is doing, what they're not doing. And just be aware, you know, being aware as a parent is so involved, is so important when your child is learning virtually. And then on the, the student side of that, being an adult, um, I think adults will learn right away if, <laughs> if virtual learning is right for them. Uh, my husband, he is not a virtual learning student. <laughs> he said it's not for him. He thrives in the classroom. I think I thrive either way. I can learn either way, kind of fluid between the two. So as superintendent, three takeaways. We're not going to force it on anyone. If you don't mm -hmm. want to learn virtually, you don't have to learn virtually. We want to keep mm -hmm. the schools open. Um, and then number two, making sure that it's implemented correctly in every school that wants to offer it is vitally important because student success is number one. Mm. Student success. Well, now you raised an issue. I don't know if you meant to, but you noticed that your husband and your son are having a little difficulty with the discipline of virtual learning where you and your daughter are flexible and are able to stick to that schedule. And I will say from my own experience that virtual learning does require a great deal of self-direction. You have to be able to stick to a schedule. You have to maintain your own interests uh, independently. Um, often you have to read text mm -hmm. on the screen or, or print things out. You have, to, um, you have to figure out ways to modify access to the information to benefit your learning style. And so this is gonna raise this issue and this is a hot button issue about different kinds of learning for different genders. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that was individual or if it's gender, because I have, you read articles about men needing to move around, or males need to move around, they need more space, they need to, uh, they have a different understanding of um, special relationships, they are more mm -hmm. kinetic learners, they, they will prosper. This is just general stuff that's yes. in the literature out there. And uh, young women who can uh, often take in the information in these structured formats more easily, more disciplined. I'm not saying that anybody's tied into a gender determinative kind of learning, but should that kind of holistic assessment be something that's being done in the schools? Yes, because I do, I can see the point that you're making because my mm. husband, his background is electrical engineering. So he mm. works with his hands and that's how he learns best the same for my son he's a musician 
um, who's taught himself to play guitar. So I can see where he's having, you know, he has to move, he has to do in order to learn. And then, like you said, on the flip side with my, my daughter and myself, although I'm an artist and I work with my hands, I can operate in, <laughs> in that cerebral mode a little bit. I don't know, I guess. I'm not really sure why that is. I'm not really looked into why my daughter is like that as well. She's a, an avid reader, but she's also a visual artist. So yes, that would be worth exploring more um, when you're looking at e-learning and, and what all encompasses that process of, of learning virtually. Yeah, I think you got it from both sides because I remember your father being so very interested in technology. And he was mm -hmm. one of the first people I know of who started using computer generated imagery and helping to teach. So, so you're, you're getting it on both sides. Maybe you're not an example. Dr. Curry, <laughs> come in and, and, and give us a more grounded view that you don't have all these special talents coming from your family and maybe, or actually you do because everyone's an educator. I, I've looked at these uh, books and the, the, the extremely well-educated uh, Seabright. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, so tell us a little bit more of what you think about an approach to technology as a curriculum that's, development. That, 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 that's, a great, that's a great question. Like Dr. Gibson said, that there are uh, many ways you can approach technology, uh, virtual learning, uh, e-learning, whatever you call it. Uh, but I, I think that um, it's important that we look at um, some solutions. Um, and one of those solutions um, is um, to consider personal learning uh, plans uh, for students, um, mm. PLP. Um, there is research um, that confirms the, the success of personal learning plans. And in those personal learning plans, um, reveal on whether or not um, the student can uh, master um, certain forms of technology, whether it's virtual learning or, or e-learning. Um, I think that's very, very important important that we um, personalize education. Um, and, 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 and I think too, um, when you talk about um, technology, uh, there's so many technological programs out there in education um, that we can glean from. Um, but at the same time, um, when it comes to technological learning, the focus must be on the student and students have to be comfortable in learning um, how to um, use technology. Right. Um, and, and, and also the parents, the parents have to um, be comfortable as well. Like I mentioned about the, the time of task that is required um, for virtual or um, e-learning. E um, and there, there are some tools and strategies to um, enable students to succeed in technology. One of those tools um, is called a task analysis um, to analyze a specific task, uh, which rarely used in education because sometimes we tell students, okay, here's this technology, um, you need wow. to use it. Well, you need a, a task analysis. You need a job aid so you can know how to use the technology. And that could be one of the tools that could bridge the gap in technologies, um, platforms of education. Sometimes it's not always the, the platform, it's the lack of knowing how to utilize the platform. Mm -hmm. um, and the task analysis uh, will give students as well as parents um, how to use that technology in the right way. Now, is the task analysis a program, or is that a person they could go to who could help move them through the uh, kinds of um, the uh, problem-solving uh, components in a particular kind of maybe a software program? Or yes. let's say, if yeah, so it, 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 would you just clarify for us? Is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah so task analysis is basically a form um, where it's like a template. Um, that could be uh, constructed by someone who um, knows the task, um, and that task analysis uh, will give you um, a guideline on how to perform a specific task. Um, and so it's, it's not um, a program in its, in its own way, 
um, but it's actually a tool that helps with programming. Um, so if I want to learn how to um, access e-learning uh, for science, well, that task analysis is going to give me specific tasks, specific steps to um, use um, that platform. Okay. So we've done a great deal of work right now with your intellectual ideas about what can do, be done to improve education. Let's go for some more personal things. Dr. Stavely Gibson, I'll start with you because you've advocated in your platform that you're running as a Republican mm -hmm. and you're running as a conservative. And uh, I don't know if that's a surprise to anybody. Um, there are a lot of uh, African-American conservative Republicans around, um, but would you say a little bit about your commitment to these social and cultural ideals and why you decided to present yourself to the state of South Carolina, which is largely conservative and largely Republican. Um, why did you decide to advocate uh, for your platform in that way? Well, it, it really all starts in Orangeburg. Uh, my parents be, uh, became born again Christians probably in the early 80s, 81, 82. And I was born in 81, so I was, I was born into a conservative Christian home. And they raised my brother and myself. Uh, we actually attended Greater Faith Baptist Church, which was in the center of town, probably within walking distance from the universities. And being a part of that faith-based community really instilled in me a love for people, a love for the community, being a servant leader. Um, and I realized early on that my convictions as a Christian really aligned with conservatism. And, and, you know, I think walking the halls at Claflin, I realized that, you know, I was in the minority. There were not a lot of conservatives um, on campus, although we had, you know, similarities as far as our character virtues, like working hard and, you know, being resilient, things that, that have character traits that have allowed Americans to move from persecution to prosperity throughout century. We all held that. However, um, what always set me apart was the fact that my my views, my political views were in alignment with my faith-based um, values. Mm -hmm. And I knew very early on before I even decided to run for state superintendent that I would be active in the Republican party and in the conservative movement simply because it aligned so well with my thoughts as an individual. Um, you know, individual responsibility, fiscal responsibility, you know, taking ownership and accountability and seizing the opportunities and that are presented to you and, you know, not being against hand ups, because I, I believe my scholarship to Claflin was a hand up, it allowed me the opportunity to, to just demonstrate hard work and perseverance and not necessarily a hand out. And then it was demonstrated throughout my whole life. My parents always worked two <laughs> or three jobs. Yeah. Uh, my grandmother, you know, she always worked. My grandfather always worked two or three jobs. My dad's mom, the same thing. It was never in us to sit around and wait for a handout. It's like, if you want it, go get it. They're not idle designed. hands. Yeah, yeah, no <laughs> idle hands. And not idle I think hands. That it's really just bubbled over into who I am as a, a public figure, as a servant leader um, in my community. And it's a perfect fit for, for my personality as well. Most people say, you know, she, she really cares for the community. And I really honestly do. I want to see people succeed and contribute positive to, positively to our communities. And what I was thinking, and in relation to that, um, the Republican Party has a certain history, uh, especially in our state, um, because of course that is the party that both liberated the Americans who were enslaved. Um, it has also undergone a serious change because with Strom Thurmond, who started as the Dixiecrat, and then uh, when Barry Goldwater supported segregation, Republicans. Uh, change. So the people have been Democrats and then they became Republicans. So there's a history burden in the um, designation of self-identification as a contemporary African-American Republican. And in talking about that, this is actually pushing me toward Dr. Curry because I was reading in Dr. Curry's book about the Hamburg massacre. 
I was reading about certain kinds of activities with the red shirts, with pitch, Pitchfork Ben Tillman, with um, certain troubling aspects of our history. And when you're teaching, when you're developing curriculum and you're teaching history, how Dr. Curry and Dr. Staley Gibson, um, would you recommend, because you, you said earlier, you know, tell the truth, tell all the truth. You know, if, it's, it's, if it's a fact, it should be it should be part of uh, what's developed depending and it must be age appropriate i would say um but how does that research dr curry uh make you feel about history and what should we be learning from history now in terms of curriculum development and, and dr staley come in there as well uh, and that's that's a great question i mean there's so many answers i could throw out there um, but I, I think you mentioned the Hamburg Massacre, and mm -hmm. as you know, uh, was a very pivotal event, uh, tragedy during the Reconstruction era. And what I have discovered in my experience um, is that local history should be at the forefront. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about you know critical race theory. There's a lot of talk about nationalizing. Um, history, but there's rarely um, emphasis on local history because one thing about local history is it's, it's the history of local communities. And in my book, um, you read the book, um, I try to bring out the local communities and the events in those communities um, that connects to my ancestry um, and the family stories. And so I think the appropriate way to get students engaged is to teach local history. Uh, like for instance, um, in, in Orangeburg, Orangeburg has a rich history of- Oh yes, history. yeah, and absolutely, yeah. Students, Orangeburg is amazing. It's amazing. I mean, students should know about the civil rights movement in Orangeburg. I mean, there are places there that students could go to and see. And so as a student, and, and some of the students have, have shared with me, because um, predominantly my work focuses in Aiken County, a lot of them will say, well, I didn't know that this was here. Um, I didn't know that um, the founders of Aiken County were African-American. And yeah. Aiken County was founded in 1871 uh, by three Civil War veterans. And so that is a local connection. And so when there, just to point out, they were on opposite sides. So they're African Americans. One of them had fought with the Confederacy, and one of them had fought with the, um, the Union. Union. And right. the third member, I, I was he, but they weren't all veterans, right? There. Yeah, well, there were three of them. Um, right. Um, Sammy J. Lee, uh, he was a body servant in the Confederate Army under his master, Sammy McGowan. And he became the first African American uh, speaker in the House of Representatives during the Reconstruction era. Um, Charles Hayne, who was a freedman from Charleston, uh, he was conscripted in, in the Confederate Army. Um, and later on, um, after um, the war, he moved to the Barnwell District and uh, began a career in education. And he was employed by the Freedmen's Bureau. And um, during the Reconstruction era, he was a legislator and Prince Rivers, uh, an amazing story who uh, he escaped from the Edgefield district to um, uh, Port Royal. And um, in 1863, uh, when the Emancipation Proclamation was read um, down there, he was in the picture uh, with the US flag. Um, and then later on, he became a legislator. And so, yes, they were on opposite sides, but they were the ones who signed the document uh, for the founding of Aiken County in 1871. And this is in my book as well. And so that local connection, because when you talk about local history, I mean, you, you fill in everything, whether it's slavery, whether it's um, racial segregation. I mean, there is no debate about that, you know, because, because local history, um, you know, cannot be altered. It comes from the community where, right. uh, where, where students could say, hey, you know, this was here. You know, I can relate to this um, instead of, you know, sometimes relating history on the national context and students will say, well, well, where's, where's that? 
you know, you know, how is that relevant um, mm -hmm. um, to me? Um, and then putting history in uh, proper context. And what I found is that you have to get on the student's level. Uh, at the end of the day, students want to know, is this, is this history relevant to me? Can I articulate it on my level? Because sometimes we get caught up in the debates and the opinions on what, for, what historical philosophy, what historiography, historiography or you know all these academic terms students don't care nothing about that they want to know is this relevant is this something that I could relate to locally and 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 is this something that I could understand and that's what they're telling me. Now, Dr. Staley Gibson you have to understand that what Dr. Curry has just done is we conceptualize these events as a town and gown activity both of you these community builders Right. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, not separate the sort of intellection of the, you know, the college campus and academic gown and whatever from the, the practical applications to the town, but to show that these two things are actually complementary, that you do need this high understanding that you both have terminal degrees, you both have doctorates. So you do need that theoretical, philosophical level of high understanding that um, comes from intense study. But there's also an ordinary kind of conversation you have to have mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day level of where's my tax money going? <laughs> what exactly. what am, what's my child <laughs> living in that school? Who mm -hmm. is teaching? So yes, yes. So and those two things are actually complementary. They're complementary. And now, Dr. Staley Gibson, I didn't start it. It was Dr. Curry who mentioned CRT. <laughs> so, what do you think about this? This largely. I think it's a false controversy, but tell us what you think. Well, my thoughts on it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start on a personal level uh, mm -hmm. with my father, who mm -hmm. integrated in Springfield, South Carolina, and we we grew up hearing the stories from him of his experience integrating and being stabbed and oh, being told Lord. that he would never be anything, and you know that they they would sit him by the window and say that they they hoped he would get shot and killed that day. So all kinds of real racism, real, very real racism that he walked wow. through and that he lived through and how he at some point as an adult had a, a point of forgiveness and realizing that he could no longer hold on to those those feelings. He had to forgive if he wanted to grow as a as a human being. And so, when he and my mom and my mom went through similar situations in Orangeburg County, um, she did not. She was not the first to integrate, but she did walk through that that racially tense era in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And because we grew, they taught us the value of forgiveness and the value of redemption. Um, I do not. I do not agree with the way that CRT is pre pre presented. I think that if we're going to teach history, it needs to be framed through the lens of forgiveness, through the lens of redemption, through the lens of factual history, all of that. And that, that we don't want ever to present content to budding minds that would divide. Mm. And I think most people who've been following me, they know my own personal history, that I am an African-American female. I am married to a Caucasian male. We have biracial children. And so when you look at it from that aspect, you don't ever want to, to present one parent as the oppressor and one as the oppressed, because at the end of the day, I'm not a victim. I'm not oppressed. You know, my husband does not try to keep me from doing anything. You know, he actually supports me and, you know, he has from the very beginning or else I would not <laughs> be married mm -hmm. to him. So um, that's from a personal, a personal account of it. But as a, as a leader, a state leader, mm -hmm. I think it would do more harm to adopt that ideology mm -hmm. um, as a whole for the state, because we want to focus on unifying. And from everything that I've studied about the, the, the critical race theory, um, it's not something that our state needs. We've, we've made grounds. There's more to make. <laughs> There's mm -hmm. more progress to make with, in terms of racial um, unity and things. So I think it would be a step in the wrong direction to, to implement those ideologies into South Carolina. 
Um, there's well, so much more we can be doing to unify. Let me, let me just give a technical note before we move on to trying to get some questions from the audience that critical race theory is actually a theoretical formulation taught in law schools. It's not really taught in any of the public schools in South Carolina or in most of the um, lower level schools, but it's usually taught at the co college level. And it is about the impact of racialized legal activities such as redlining, mm -hmm. such as the things that happened to your father. Uh, it is not necessarily about teaching people to hate or, or be oppressed, but it is about the contextualizing legal and um, uh, administrative effects that racialized administrations have had on real individuals. That's that's what really critical race theory is. It is not some kind of formulation that people use in, in public schools anyway. So just want to put that there as a as a uh, kind of clarifying caveat. But I wanted to open up the uh, the program to the questions from our audience. Is there anyone in the audience who has questions they'd like to pose? to either Dr. Curry or Dr. Celia Gibson. Any questions? Let me check the chat to see if there are any questions in the chat there. And I think you're right that they're not teaching the actual theory in K through 12. However, we are seeing where there are resources that are used within the classroom that have the ideology of CRT. And I think that's where some of the concern comes in from, from parents and educators. But the concern probably comes in from ex ex exercises and activities that are coming from workshops where usually it's about um, someone's formulation of diversity training. And I think that's really the culprit. It's not the Harvard-based theoretical formulation of what critical, it's, it's you no, know, people aren't doing that. That's, no. that's a false argument. That's, that's just not happening. But yeah, there might be um, sensitivity trainings that people are responding to. Any Questions from our audience? No one has questions? We're at 614. No? Well, I can go ahead. We generally end at about 630. So I was going to go ahead. So you've spoken then also, Dr. Staley Gibson, about your person, your, your position as a person of faith and the impact. So I think you've actually already explained to us the importance of your personal journey of faith and how it influences some of your decisions and some of your awareness and some of how you engage with the world with this uh, I concept of the spirit of forgiveness. And I'm going to put words in your mouth and also a spirit of goodwill. That's the way that you're, this idea of goodwill being the way to lead us into conversations, um, that's part of what you're, you're advocating. Absolutely, I feel that, you know, having a spirit, a listening spirit, um, and, and placing yourself in a position to not just hear the words, but hear the heart of people is very important um, because there, there is a human element. And I think we tend to forget that when we, we become so intellectual and you know we start to dive into the data and the numbers that there are actual human beings behind those numbers that are very important that, that need to be nurtured and um, so I really focus a lot on the human element of, of the decisions that we make, um, which kind of goes full circle back to policies and how we view the world and interact within the world. Now we do have another this week uh, discussion planned um, based on the film Shared History, which is about some of these issues. Um, Shared History is a film that was made by Felicia Furman who is descended from William Gilmore Sims, whose books are in our libraries. Uh, he was one of the early historians of South Carolina who told a very racialized uh, pro-slavery interpretation of history, um, which is you know, fundamentally in some ways inaccurate um, because slavery was uh, certainly a part of our history, but we should not falsely pretend that it was a, a very positive part of our history. I think that we need to we need to be able to discuss it honestly. And Felicia Furman is a descendant of William Gilmore Sims, and of, I think her grandmother's name was Mary Oliphant, who also wrote these books of history about South Carolina. And she wanted to come to terms with the um, with the stories that she'd been raised as a young Caucasian woman growing up, I think, in Greenville, um, with the racialized things that she saw and trying to reconcile that, trying to reconcile 
the reality of her experience of African Americans and other diverse Americans as being people of value and intellect with some of the racialized messages that were in her home. So she made this film to investigate these relationships between the families, the families of the descendants who were enslaved and the families of the descendants of the enslavers. And it shows a great many points about these conversations we're having now, especially some of what might be applicable as um, the outcomes of what can be formulated under critical race theory about advantages that people did accrue because they had more money, they had more access, they had more land, they had you know, all these things. So with that being said, um, Dr. Steele Gibson, would you, because the film is a form of art, would you just give us a quick summary of your idea of the role of art in uh, education as an artist, as an art educator, as a person who's working with divergent learning? What is the role of art in the overall complex of education? And then Dr. Curry, you could give us your idea as well of art and literature. And then you'll both sum up and tell us your, your next projects. And I think we'll be out of time. <laughs> so. Well, the, the role of art, I think, has always been and will always be um, a method of recording history, a method of showcasing emotion, thought, um, passion. And I think that, that we should continue to cultivate the arts, and I say arts in general, um, meaning performing and visual, it is so important to our culture. Um, as, as a state, we, we definitely don't want to, to lose our value for the arts. And I think it's important for us to continue to heavily fund the arts. I think I, I spoke on it earlier that uh, when you are involved in the arts, you see greater levels of achievement simply because you're operating on that higher level um, which is to create. Um, so it will definitely be beneficial for our students in South Carolina to have great exposure to the arts. Um, and I, I, I have to go back to Cecil Williams because he did such an, an excellent job of capturing history. Um, Another Claflin graduate, by the way. <laughs> yes, because of what he did, like we have just a, a window into what the generation before us went through um, and it's, it's amazing that he even had the mind during that time mm -hmm. of the importance of what he was doing yeah. um, and so many many other artists I could call their names but we we must continue to hold on to the value of art and not let it become watered down or just an afterthought so as superintendent I will definitely make Fun sure art's at the forefront, <laughs> forefront. <laughs> Yes. Terrific. Yeah. Dr. Curry? That's a great point. Um, in my experience, I have discovered um, a connection between um, history and art, um, and uh, more specifically, a connection between family history and art. And so the idea was brought up to me um, by my Sarah, um, Chicago Crawford, and we discussed about how can we bring out the stories of my ancestors and relatives in the book through art. And so I have directed her and she has created four art pieces um, that reflect the ancestral experiences of my family. Um, many of those ancestral experiences are agricultural um, pursuits, um, enslaved experiences, and when I look at those art pieces, um, it brings the, the family history um, to life uh, through art, uh, where it gives a psychological effect. Um, and so in the, in the book, you read about, um, <clears throat> for instance, uh, my ancestor, Lavinia Perla Thompson, um, told um, a, a narrative to her grandchildren about how she was beaten by the slave auctioneer. And, um, and the reason why she was beaten because she refused um, to be sold. Uh, she wanted to stay with her master. And so um, there's a picture called Enslaved Experience um, that reflect that, that event. Um, it's like a dichotomy where um, she is wearing a white dress because she did uh, uh, wear a white dress, according to her narrative, um, on the auction block uh, with the auctioneer. 
Um, and there's another image that showed that the auctioneer um, beat her um, and the white dress um, has red um, because she said in the narrative that she was beaten so bad that her white dress became bloody. And so um, this art collection that I'll be working on is gonna be uh, titled Ancestral um, Voices, um, Bringing History, uh, Family History Alive um, through ancestry and the arts. Now, looking at your book, and you have an image of Joseph and Martha Kishing Seawright Ellison on the cover. And of course, yeah. photography is an art yeah. form. And it's so compelling whenever we can see an image of an ancestor. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can see some of ourself in the ancestor. Well, absolutely. And that is so reinforcing. Dr. Gibbs, are you about to say something? No, I was just agreeing with, with what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So images and the art can be fundamental. Um, I see there's a question. I'm going to ask Omari Fox to unmute and to come on uh, the program and ask his question because he is an educator and a community activist. Omari, would you just go ahead and pose your question to our panel? Yeah. Um, uh... On a quasi post retirement from South Carolina public schools. Um, they're not really a super fan of intelligent black people and certainly the weird artists. Um, but I've always believed that um, the art teacher, whatever the genre, was still an intricate part, not necessarily like art is over there and those are the weird bohemians. Um, I always thought that we had an intricate relationship that could be complementary to the rest of the school's um, subjects and just kind of school culture. So just what do y'all believe um, either distinguishes the fine arts teacher or works in pocket or is complementary to the rest of the school? Well, how, do the arts complement the, how do the arts complement the uh, other parts of the curriculum? So it's a little bit of a question about interdisciplinary studies. How do the interdisciplinary parts work with the arts? Yes. Great question. I, 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 okay. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, um, to your point, Dr. Martin, um, the arts um, do complement uh, the curriculum um, in many creative ways, um, in social studies especially. Um, when you look at um, images, um, you, you look at African-American history, uh, images of, of African art, images of slavery and the Jim Crow era. And when you look at those images, you're asking um, students to uh, interpret what those images mean. And um, those images are primary source um, documents. And there are um, a plethora of resources out there um, that um, have uh, historical images um, along with the assessments that um, teachers can use um, um, to, to assess their students. And also, um, when you look at um, you know, the, the integration of arts, we're not just talking about painting, uh, but we're also talking about other arts like dance and music. Um, you know, you look at uh, cultural relevant pedagogy, um, one um, tool that has been used um, quite frequently um, is rap, um, having students to create uh, rap lyrics um, to mm -hmm. uh, tell a historical event um, or put things in a historical context through rap. And, and so it's that creativity. And that's when the teachers uh, are going to have to do some research on their students. Uh, I'm talking about um, surveys, um, surveying their students, find out their talents and interests in the arts and take that data and create lessons uh, that connects uh, their interests in the arts um, to um, the curriculum. Well, you asked what makes the fine arts teacher different. I would have to say that fine arts teachers tend to um, operate more on the innovative side. They challenge their students to think creatively, to dissect, to critique. And those are not things that you normally would see in um, what 
what we call the mainstream classroom. I'm like, you're, mm -hmm. you're reading, you're writing, your math class, such like things like that. So I think the, the fine arts teacher uh, dives into a student's emotions, um, how they feel about the world around them. And it kind of ties into what we were saying earlier about children, uh, students being able to compare and contrast, talk about similarities and differences. So they're, they're challenged on a higher level in those fine arts classes, whether it's, you know, creating a picture or composing a musical piece or, you know, creating a lyrical dance that they're, again, operating at those higher levels, which um, when done over a long period of time, it will become almost, what do they call it? Um, brain, what is it? Memory, rope, not rope memory. I can't think of the term, but it's second nature. It, it's something that they do and apply to every oh. part of thinking. I can't remember the correct term for it, but it almost like a habit. That's how Becomes they are. like muscle memory. That's the word I was looking at, the muscle yeah. memory. <laughs> yeah, muscle. it becomes automatic. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, and, and um, I've always advocated for the arts and the interpretation of meaning in the arts as being a very rich tool for helping young students and older students as they develop uh, deal with complex ideas, mm -hmm. deal with uh, taking in disparate bits of information and integrating that and then coming out. I mean, that's what the term intelligence is, intelligere, to, to link things together. Um, intelligence is this ability to look at things that are disparate, find what the similarities may be, find where the overlaps are, and to make connections. And that is the thing that uh, we hope that we are helping young people develop as a skill uh, in, in interpreting works of art. So we've got two minutes left. Um, I just wanna start by thanking our guests. I think we've had a fantastically interesting conversation. Uh, Mr. Fox Omar, do you have uh, any another question before we go, before we wind down? Yeah, I guess maybe just, um... And when I was teaching, I had uh, a lot of like aha uh -huh moments where I, where I learned, I had to learn how my students learn. And that was kind of a, you can't learn that. You can read about it in, in your student education program. You gotta be in real time with your students. So I just, uh, the, the positive of social media is I'm able to stay in touch with my students in that way. And they're always telling me about some moment in class or visiting an artist that stuck out with them. And I've had thousands of students, so I'm not remembering like every granular moment, but I do remember some of them. So just for y'all, do y'all have like a, a story that's been reflected back to you from maybe someone you encountered or just something in your travels where you was like, yo, that was a, that was a very powerful thing that stays with me and I kind of carry with me. That's, that's that's a that's a great question, and um, I, I can tell you a lot of those aha moments for me um, have occurred outside the classroom. Uh, me being um, a consultant with um, with schools um, in Aiken County through my work, um, I have curated a series of walking um, tour exhibits um, in which uh, the exhibits focus on the stories uh, in my book. And um, one of those exhibits uh, focused on my enslaved ancestor, who I just mentioned, Levine and Corley Thompson. And uh, me and a friend of mine uh, constructed a half slave deck because we wanted to show um, how the slaves went into the ship and how they lie down uh, with little to no room. And so the slave half deck model uh, was used as part of, of the exhibit and students were fascinated because they felt how the slaves felt. No room, no wiggle room, um, mm -hmm. real tight space. And so that was an aha moment um, uh, for me where students could say, okay, this is real. Um, and I have several artifacts that I use um, in my exhibits. Is that part of the new International African American Museum in Charleston? Will that be, are you consulting with them as well? Uh, I will, uh, I am, um, in fact, I'll be doing uh, four lectures at the Charleston County Library um, mm -hmm. in conjunction with the International African American Museum, uh, features my uh, book, The Thompson Family, on Told Stories from the Past from 1830 to 1960. 
And Dr. Staley, do you have any, sorry, Dr. Staley Gibson, do you have any new projects that are coming up before we conclude? Um, I don't. Not nothing right now with, of course, running for office. Um, I am working on pieces. I'm always creating art. So I guess that's a yes. Um, I am doing some, some things privately. Um, I don't think I am involved in any art exhibits. Um, right now, dad is kind of organizing all of that for us. If we're going to be a part of a show, normally it's as a family. We'll do the three of us together. Um, but outside of campaigning and creating and being mom and wife and teacher. <laughs> Sounds like yeah. you're a little bit busy there. <laughs> well, I have to point out, I didn't mention earlier that Dr. Staley Gibson and both her parents um, exhibited at the Standback Museum when she was still, I think you were still in high school when that happened. Probably so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as a family. And, um, and that was when I, well, I knew her before that because of her parents, but that was when I really got to know her and to see her work. And it's been so wonderful to watch her <laughs> blossom and develop uh, into this mature, politically involved uh, community of personalities. So I think, and the last thing, did you find any images, Dr. Steele? I, I do, I have yeah. some that I can share. Yeah, just share a few images of your work with us before we go, because you saw Dr. Curry's book. Let's see, how means, can I, um, do I have sharing rights? Or, yeah, just say, like do I, mean, I think what, I do, I have them, yep. You have them? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Let's see. If y'all oh. can see that, I'm gonna try yeah. to blow it up. That's um, one that's on, I have a book of poetry, that's the cover. And that's actually uh, my daughter mm -hmm. that when she was about, I don't know, maybe five or six. Um, and it's a mixed media. So that's why you see the, that's oil pastel through there and then cloth and then um, hair to make it come to life. That's one of my son right after I had him. So this piece is probably a little over 16 years old. Mm, wow. That's um, mixed media. That's I know you, use a lot of, kids. you often use Prismacolor, I remember. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, I love Prismacolor pencil. I love chalk pastel. That's what this one is, chalk pastel. Mm -hmm. And I use a lot of uh, mixed media. And that was the influence of Dr. Hunter, Dr. Mm -hmm. Terry K. Hunter. He Hunter. really pushed me to um, explore mixed media. And this one was done um, probably 2004 or five. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a mixed media piece as well. A lot of collaging um, and that's color pencil with a little bit of oil pastel. Mm -hmm. And that's the children. It's now I laid me down to sleep when they were very young. And this one is, has um, just a lot of connection between my husband's side of the family and my son, and it shows him pondering his history, his roots, and you can see the roots of uh, the tree that lead back to the soldier, um, because we found in searching my husband's history, every one of his, his male ancestors fought in war, oh. and um, it's, it was just an opportunity for us to speak to David about his history on my side, his history on his dad's side, and to allow him time and space to think about what all of that means for who he is and who he will become. So, um, and this very last piece was done under Dr. Hunter when I was at Claflin. Uh, one of my favorite pieces called Wave No More. And it was done during the time um, when the, the huge debate over whether or not the, the Confederate flag needed to be removed. And for me, it was deeper than just the flag waving on top of the state house. It was like, we need to, not allow this to wave anymore in the hearts and minds of people. We we need to, to do some soul searching and address those those issues of prejudice and racism because it does no good to remove it from the the outward if we're not going to investigate and, and pull it from within ourselves and you know not pick it up again. So that's where that and this piece is probably the oldest <laughs> out of all the ones that I that I chose to show. So and that's collage and that mixed media that Dr. Hunter really, you know, pushed me outside my box because mm. before then I was mainly oil paint and oil pastel and color pencil. So that's the period when Dr. Hunter was working at Claflin. Yes. Was, yes. Yeah. 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 Dr. Hunter, in case people don't know, is a, a quite famous uh, printmaker across our state. 
Yeah. Um, and he is married to Gilda Cobb Hunter, who's also involved in politics. She's a, a state house representative for Orangeburg County. So with that, I, I didn't, I didn't get the the uh huh story from Dr. Gibson. Oh, oh <laughs> my my aha uh -huh story. Well, it kind of goes back to what Walter said with connecting with your students. And I kind of touched on the human element that I feel is so important when we are teaching students. I had a young lady, she was in ninth grade. I was probably in my eighth year as a teacher. And she, I always knew her to come in bubbly and just excited, very talkative. And this particular day, she did not. And immediately that was a red flag to me. Even as a somewhat new teacher, I was like, something's not right. And I kept pushing her and pushing her, what's wrong, what's wrong? And finally she said, well, I took pills today and I don't know what they were. And my heart dropped because I knew in that moment if we didn't get her help immediately, she may, she may die. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, that aha moment was as a teacher, you have to be aware. It doesn't matter how many students pass through your door. You have to be aware of who they are as individuals and make sure that you are not just meeting their need educationally, but in some cases you have to meet their needs emotionally. And from that day forward, I made a point within myself that it's got to be deeper than just teaching art. It has to be that that human element, this is a person, is forefront. And I, like you, I still communicate with her to this day she, through Facebook, of course, but she's an adult. And because of that, that decision, that quick decision I made to get her the help, you know, it took her to the hospital, flushed her stomach, but she could have died that day. Oh my. And it really left an impression on, on me. I know Mari has actually a similar story. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so that's, wow. that's interesting, an interesting connection there. But we'll save that for another time for anecdotes from teachers about saving the lives of their students. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen for the final time. Let me see if I can go back to our end. So that actually completes our program. And I'd like to thank our, our distinguished guests so much for their wonderful conversation. Um, Dr. Kizzy Staley Gibson and Dr. Walter Curry, um, artist and author. Uh, thank you so much for your discussions. Thank you. Good luck in your future thank endeavors. You. Thank you. And thank you this program was, if I can find all my little graphics here, in part sponsored by the South Carolina Progressive Network, which is uh, also affiliated with the Majesco Simpson School for uh, human rights, which is about citizenship and about our roles being responsible members of the society. And this event is part of our Twigs Rose Festival of the Arts in Orangeburg County, the celebration of local HBCUs and higher educational institutions, and is supported in part by the Orangeburg County Council. Thank you all again.